Hello, I'm Christopher Gervais reporting for WVVH-TV and tonight we are here for the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival that's running at the Bay Street Theater. It will include filmmakers such as Celine Cousteau and Bob Simon from 60 Minutes CBS News. They travel thousands of miles, even crossing oceans along the way. And as they migrate, birds connect our world. In the summer, they call our backyards and our forests their home. But at other times of the year, they must fly south to tropical and subtropical parts of the world where they can find warmth and food during the cold winter months. Tropical forests support some of the greatest diversity of life on Earth. But these same areas also produce one of the most valuable commodities on Earth. Coffee. Traditionally grown in the shade of mature trees and forests, Coffee travels in and out of the tropics and all over the world. People drink nearly a billion cups of it every day. <laughs> but in the last 30 years, over half of farms that grow coffee have eliminated the forests and shade trees that tropical wildlife depend upon. The resulting sun-grown coffee farms are relatively barren and can support only 10% of their former diversity. This land is no longer hospitable to the majority of creatures that call tropical rainforests home. Your daily coffee has an impact thousands of miles away. But what you drink, and how you ask for it, can be the key to a solution. In the foothills of the Andes Mountains in northern Colombia, the rainfall is high and the climate is warm, which create perfect conditions for growing coffee. Because of steep terrain, most farming done in this region of small towns are of modest size. And as a result, shade-grown coffee production continues. Sun-grown coffee grows faster, but also requires chemical fertilizers and other agents to produce more beans. Because of these added expenses, Many smaller farms in Latin America have kept shade trees and shade tolerant coffee varieties. On these family owned farms, more so than the larger corporate ones, the health and value of the land is appreciated as it is passed on to new generations. Shade coffee farms may contain dozens of native tropical tree species which in turn host an increased diversity of other plants and animals. I want to introduce you now to an extraordinary gentleman, a wildlife filmmaker, but he is also president of Trust for Wildlife and president emeritus of the American Chestnut Foundation. His name is Marshall Case and he has traveled here from Vermont to do a book signing this evening and also to present several of his films here at this film festival. Marshall, thank you for coming. Thank you, Chris. Sir. Pleasure to be here and to be back. Second time for That's me. That's right. You were here last yeah. year. We're I was very here grateful. Was, you even got me on the committee to help right. come to the second. Excellent. So very pleased to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, Trust for Wildlife and the American Chestnut Foundation? Just in a quick summary. Yeah, Trust for Wildlife is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit, so it's a conservation organization, and we started in 1983. 
by coincidence, the same year that the American Chestnut Foundation started, which I'd been head of. So under the umbrella of the trust, uh, we've been doing rehabilitation work with eagles and hawks and birds of prey for years, and then a lot of education programs stretch from Russia to Central and South America, into the Caribbean, and last year we produced the film, as you know, on neotropical migrant birds. Yes. And those are those special ones that go between North America and the Latin Americas. And we produce that in both Spanish and English because we have a large audience with Spanish language to the south and a growing number of people, kids in schools here in America, North America, who are uh, in our system and are still learning the language and this helps them get into the wildlife area as well because we have the dual language program. And that, uh, last year, we felt good to introduce the Shade Grown Coffee story, which entails about 3% of market share. Coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. Most people don't understand that. And as Americans, we drink on average three and a half cups per day. So if we can get people to shift their coffee drinking choice from uh, sun-grown or open-grown coffee to shade-grown coffee, we could have a tremendous positive impact on the rainforest, which sure. are being cut for the other. So that was the storyline, and the birds are at the center of the story as part of the wildlife connection and habitat. So last year's film, Migratory Birds and Shane Grown Coffee, not only is it an entertaining and educational film, but this could greatly help impact the preservations of rainforests cutting down because of coffee. Absolutely. And the benefit to the consumer here is they don't have to give donations to make it happen. They just switch their coffee drinking habit by asking for shade grown, fair trade coffee at the store or wherever they go to the supermarket. And that will help increase the number of people that will shift away from the destructive coffee products, which are cut where the forest is cut and they grow a more aggressive uh, tree and burn the soils out. You mentioned that coffee is the second most traded commodity mm -hmm. next to oil. Right. Speaking of which, Worldwide. you have a film this year on the oil spill and its impact on wildlife in the Gulf of Mexico. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, this film is uh, after the Gulf spill and it focuses on habitat and wildlife in jeopardy. And the reason that I thought about this last year during this festival, seeing the other films that we presented, it seemed like uh, a lot of the information coming out didn't ring true. I'm a wildlife biologist and an educator, and a lot of the information coming out about how quickly the systems were coming back and being repaired didn't sound true. So we worked together, Sam Moore, who is the filmmaker who works with me, and I worked up the script for this, and he went down to Louisiana, and he spoke with the fish and wildlife people there, local uh, shrimp, person who has, makes his business and did a really thorough study of what the reality is just months ago. We're talking about something very recent. Okay. And the idea here is to get people on board to try to, again, make better choices on the amount of consumption and also look at the issues that are in the news right now, which are going to affect our country dramatically in the future. And that would be drilling in the Beaufort Sea off of Alaska, which could be very dangerous in my opinion and a lot sure. of others. The tar sands issue, bringing a pipeline from Alberta to the Gulf of Mexico, more oil potential problems, and they don't have the solution yet if they do have a major spill, okay. and that kind of a thing. So we're, we're concerned that people get enough information, like through the film festival here, and then through the news media coverage, so that we can actually get more people dealing with the issue in their own community, and then collectively, hopefully make a decision uh, for our government and our local bodies to either push back and say, no, we don't need this, or let's get better regulations. At least let's enforce what we have. Okay. That's the basic, but it's a lot of wildlife, not doom and gloom. No. It's what the, what the wildlife that we need to hang on to and uh, how we can be part of making that possible. Great. Well, thank you. Marshall's film is a world premiere. Anything worth doing, whether or not they're making a big impact, you know, it's hard to tell. It's going to be difficult to assess. I mean, Clinton and them, though, and they stay out here. We have crews that stay out here and monitor. I mean, they're doing anything they do is something positive, for the most part. I mean, if we're involved in it to make sure they're not doing more damage than good. What the guys back there were doing were they, they take test holes, and they're looking for tar patterns. And 
when they find the tar patty, they scrape off the top layers of clean sand, and then they scoop out the, uh, the contaminated sand. And the contaminated sand, obviously, they bag it up, and then they will put the clean sands back on top to try to build a hole back up. Because we, we have an erosion problem, and we want to keep as much of our sand as we can. And that's where we have a, a Wilson's Clover nest. And uh, we want to keep the activity to a minimum around those areas. Because uh, they, they don't like disturbance. It's, they're trying to raise their nests there. We like to keep people away from them as much as possible. I'm here with Kara Jackson, the Director of Communications for the Long Island Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy has been an integral part of this year's film festival, both providing us with films, a world, world premiere film, Home for Hawksbill, and also as a, a great supporter of the event. Kara, thank you for coming out this evening. And tell us why you folks at the Nature Conservancy wanted to get involved in this year's film festival. Sure. Well, thank you, Christopher, for having us. It's really a pleasure to be part of this amazing film festival, the world-class film festival with, you know, such as, you know, with the producers such as yourself. Um, film is very important to the Nature Conservancy. It's a way of bringing nature to people in their own backyards. And it's not a replacement for nature. It's a way of enhancing people's of experience of it. So again, we're just so happy to be part of this and the films we've seen so far have been fabulous. So I really want to thank you for extending the invitation for us to participate this year. Well, thank you for being a part. And, and again, thank you for WVVH-TV for being here at this event. And we hope that the Nature Conservancy is part of the event next year and that the relationship continues for many years to come. We're here with an extraordinary individual, uh, one of the world's greatest underwater filmmakers, authors, and explorers, John Bowermaster. And John is screening his film this weekend called Sola, Southern Louisiana Water Stories. Hi, John. Thank you for coming here yeah, this thank weekend. You. Thank Could you. you tell me a little bit about your, your film that uh, you're showing here uh, this weekend? Well, ironically, we've made a dozen films in, a dozen, in, in the last dozen years about ocean and ocean-related issues. This one has very little adventure in it and, and no underwater. I mean, it's, it's really about the people of southern Louisiana. And we, we went, uh, we began filming in July of 2008 uh, and filmed for about two years. We're just finishing the film when the, when the spill began in the Gulf. So we stopped finishing the film, went back down, re-interviewed everyone. And, and what we're going to show tonight is, is the, the, the culmination of two plus years of filming. And I've seen the film, it's an extraordinary film. I believe the audience here is going to thoroughly enjoy it. What are some of the other films that you've shot uh, in recent years? Well, the most recent films are one in the Galapagos called What Would Darwin Think? Yes. Uh, Man versus Nature. We uh, showed that here last year. Yeah. yeah. And prior to that, we spent a couple months uh, sailing along the peninsula of Antarctica. Okay. Made a beautiful film about the future, the present and future of the Antarctic Peninsula. Okay. And prior to that, I did a series of eight films for National Geographic about our, I, I had done a 10 year long project funded by the Geographic where we literally went around the world one continent at a time by sea kayak. And we made a film of each of those uh, trips. That's extraordinary. Yeah. What uh, what can you tell us about maybe some of your your future expeditions, your future films coming up? At well, we're going back to Antarctica this uh, January uh, with 3D cameras. Okay. I've never made a 3D film, but uh, the distribution of of this one is for science institutions and museums around the world. So it's kind of an interesting way to experiment with this new uh, genre of, of, of filmmaking. So we'll spend another month again in a sailboat along the peninsula of Antarctica. Okay. And if people want to learn more about your films and your books and your expeditions, you, you do have a website? Oh yeah, we've got a great website, just johnbowermaster.com, J-O-N. J-O-N. Yeah. That's John, J-O-N, Bowermaster.com, an extraordinary author, filmmaker, and explorer, and who has graciously come here to show last year his film and this year's Sola at the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival. And, and John, we hope you return here for future years to show your upcoming films, and it's been a delight uh, showing your film last year, and I know the audience is looking forward to seeing uh, Sola for this year.
Cajun, the Creole, the food, the music. I think we're one of the richest places in the world. But now our natural resources are something that folks who've been in power have abused and neglected. It's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful place to raise your family, um, other than getting shot at. We're in the twilight of an industry here. We don't want no handouts. We just want to make an honest living. Illegal organizing happened here in the United States, and nobody's covering it, you know? Corruption uh, is probably the biggest problem, money in politics. Oh, the oil industry is completely uh, drives this state. Drill, baby, drill. Drill, baby, drill. You can come off the coast of Louisiana, see how we're doing it with the most modern technology. There's no one who wants this thing over more than I do. You know, I'd like my life back. They're companies. They're not even people, they're corporations. There's a lot of folks who are good neighbors, but there is this percentage of folks that are really bad neighbors. Unfortunately, I don't think the powers to be have actually heard the message. Well, he's the ecosystem itself, you know. He's like, uh, he's one of the faces of a god. I'm with an extraordinary individual who is Charlotte Taylor, who is a resident of East Hampton, New York. And Charlotte is not just a volunteer at the film festival, but she's also our greatest benefactor. And without her participation this year, this film festival would not have happened. And also, many thanks to her daughter, Blair Taylor, who's also a trusted volunteer, but also a major contributor to the film festival. Charlotte, thank you for, for helping us with this event, and tell us why you, you got involved with the film festival. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, I'm just a big believer in wildlife and uh, the saving of habitat and the animals themselves. I've traveled a lot all over the world, and I see dwindling wildlife populations, and I'd like to do anything I can to make people see how fragile, in a certain way, the populations are and that all of us need to get together whether we're arborists or gardeners, um, teachers, um, scuba divers, everybody needs to get together and get behind the cause because now is the time. Carol, I thank you for your support. We hope that you and Blair and others like you will continue to support this film festival for many years to come because without your support this event would not have happened next this year and it certainly won't happen next year or future years. I'm here with Charles Fasano who has traveled all the way from Hawaii to be here in Sag Harbor for the Wildlife Conservation Film Festival. Charles is a marine biologist but he is also an underwater wildlife filmmaker and his film is premiering here tonight uh, and it is called Hawaii's Undersea Ohana. Charles, can you tell us a little bit about your film? Oh yes, mahalo Chris, thank you very much for having me here, aloha. Uh, my, my film, Hawaii's Undersea Ohana, tells a story of Hawaii's marine animals and how they're connected together as family through their niches and roles for the betterment of the reef system. Um, the Hawaiians had seen these connecti the connectivity and these niches that they wrote proverbs, olelos, that assimilate the Hawaiian cultural life and their societal life with the marine life. Excellent. Sir. And your film is, uh, is, is been shown in Hawaii, but this is the first time it's been shown on mainland United States, yes? Correct, exactly. This is a mainland uh, premiere, and it has been in several film festivals on, uh, on the, in the state of Hawaii on the Big Island. Charles, thank you for coming here, and we look forward to seeing your film. It's my pleasure, Chris. Mahalo and aloha. Again, I'm Christopher Chivet with WVVH-TV, and we're back here at the Bay Street Theater for the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival, and I'm with here an extraordinary woman, a wildlife filmmaker, and also an author, Marie Wilkinson. And one of her books is here right now, which is Walking Thunder on African Elephants, and both she and her husband, Cyril Crystal, are showing four films this weekend on elephants, tigers, 
and uh, another on their son in Africa, Lissandra Song. And Marie, thank you for coming this year to thank the you. film festival. Could you tell us a little bit about your films? Thank you, Christopher, and thank you for organizing this amazing festival. Um, our films are about endangered species and their critically challenged habitats and how they connect with the psyche of the human, all o humans all over the world, whether it be the elephant and stories of Babar or saggy baggy pants or Dumbo or whether it's the tiger and, and tiger tiger burning bright. The third subject is the polar bears of the Arctic. And as we all know, the Arctic ices are melting and polar bears are critically challenged for food and for access to their food. So we've been exploring these various species. And you have, you have a film this year on saving the African elephant, saving the lion, and then bringing back the tiger. You have so we have three very short films, trailers, um, that are three to seven minutes. One is called... Bringing Back the Tiger. Bringing Back the Tiger. The, the second one is called Last Stand of the African Lion. And the third one is called Last Stand of the African Elephant. And now that's a sh very short introduction. It was our, our prelude to the larger film which is called The Sanders Song. The Sanders yeah. Song, which is about which is an expansion of the first and it involves a number of interviews with indigenous people and their stories around elephants and how it connects them to place and how it should connect, continue to connect us to place. Well, thank you, Marie. We greatly appreciate having you and Cyril as part of this film festival and Marie and her husband Cyril's films all four will be screened this weekend at the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Film Festival. And Marie, do you have a website for people to come to find you and Cyril about your, your information? We do. It's www.christoandwilkinsonphotography.com. Well, thank you. That's fantastic. We hope to have you involved with this film festival for many years to come. Supreme pastoralists walk towards a watering hole while a herd of elephants come out of the dust like an apparition. There are stories from the first peoples of Africa that attest to a remarkable bond between elephants and people, a bond that goes beyond folklore and legend, a deep psychological and metaphysical alliance we sever at our own peril. There is a legend among both the Kikuyu and the Chaga people of Mount Kilimanjaro that elephants formerly were men and women who, like Adam and Eve, gave offense to God, not in their case by disobedience, but by vanity and extravagance. To make themselves look beautiful, they washed in milk, and for this the Creator expelled them from their Eden, inflicting on them milk-white tusks as a perpetual reminder of their folly. We left the plains of Amicelli and flew north by and fought with her tusks and carried him around looking for the mother to give him back to the mother. She was protecting the child from the threat of wild animals in that area, from potential danger. She carried it around and around, eventually coming back to the place where she found the child and put him back on the ground. Since the mother was not back yet, the elephant stood around, making big noise to chase away anything that might hurt the child, until the mother returned and took back the child. A child, even the size of the sander, could be held on the elephant's tusks and looked after so that he wouldn't get eaten by hyenas or lions. Elephants care very deeply for their families. A herd is made up of mothers and sisters and daughters, aunties and cousins, and that sense of care to protect extends out to humans. If, for some reason, a human mother has to give birth to her baby outside the manana, somewhere out in the bush, maybe she was collecting firewood or water and couldn't get back quickly enough, a mother elephant would come to protect and nurture this young thing. She would come and she would smell around with her trunk, as if making a blessing. Her belly would rumble 
letting all those around know she was there and she would calmly remain nearby. The elephants know when a mother has just had a baby and they come to make sure everything is okay and then calmly wander away. We are here with Cyril C Crystal a wildlife filmmaker and an author, and Cyril's actually a native here to the Hamptons. Uh, Cyril, you and your wife live in, uh, in Amagansett. Amagansett, and Cyril, you have uh, three films that we're screening this evening. Uh, the one, one big one. One big one. We're, uh, I know one is about lions and another is about elephants, and uh, could you tell us briefly a little bit about your films? We know that the lion could potentially disappear within 10 years. That's not a good thing. And there's only 3,000 tigers left. And the way the Chinese go, there could be no elephants roaming as we've known them within 15 or less. That's a calamity beyond comprehension. And your book is called uh, Elephants Walking Thunder, is it not? Walking Thunder in the Footsteps of the African Elephant. And you have published several books, have you not, on wildlife? The one on the, the tribes included the wildlife because we've always tended to separate the human from the wild or the other beings, the other animals, that's a mistake. Shoshone getting driven off Yellowstone. The Wali and Gulu getting kicked out of uh, southern Kenya and Savo. And if we uh, don't listen to the people who've honored the an animals the most, the other animals, then we continue to treat them as commodities and trophies and that's the way we uh, think about the fires in Texas. They're good trophy hunters there so maybe there's a karmic return. Everything comes full circle. I'm here once again with Cyril Crystal and Cyril and his wife Marie Wilkinson are screening their films this evening, Bringing Back the Tiger, Last of the African Lion, and Last of the African Elephant and they'll also be showing uh, Lysander's Song, which is about elephants and their son Lysander. And of course, Cyril and Marie will have an opening at MoMA in Manhattan next week, uh, celebrating their film Lysander's Song. And you can go to Cyril, what is your website for people can find you and get some more information? Christo and Wilkinson Photography.com. The okay. MoMA is uh, Tuesday, September 27th at 7. Well, thank you for being a part of this film festival. We're honored to have you here. And we hope that uh, you and your wife continue to produce these wonderful films and we can screen them for many years in the future. We need help with the next one. This is an appetizer. Understandable. The appetizers, the Sander song is a preamble, but now we're really getting serious. You want to hear one great story? A Liberian elder after the Civil War in uh, Liberia was with his forces trying to oust Charles Taylor with Master General. 1,200 soldiers on the ground. Out of the blue came a la very large being, the likes of which they've never seen, even though they live in Africa. But in Liberia, there were almost no elephants left. Out of the blue appeared an elephant. It was their sign to lay down their weapons. The Civil War ended upon the sighting of this elephant out of the blue. It's pretty amazing. Well, that is a great story and hopefully one of many to be told both this weekend and in the future. And once again, this is Christopher Gervais for WVVH-TV here at the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival. Hi, I'm Marshall Case with the American Chestnut Foundation, and this is a book that we published recently about the restoration of the American chestnut, which is the icon in the eastern part of the United States. Back in the early 1900s, a blight came in on nursery stock from Europe, and it knocked out 25% of the entire eastern forest of our trees. And they were heavily hardwood trees, of course, and the American chestnut is the giant of the eastern forest, topped out at 120 to 130 feet in height, and trees were often between 8 to 10 or 12 feet in diameter. A record tree was 17 and a half feet in diameter. So the, the work of the Chestnut Foundation, and this has been going on since 1983, is to figure out how to restore this magnificent mighty giant, as we call it, to the eastern forest, and therefore help restore forest health, which is in jeopardy right now all over the east from a lot of invasive species that have come in. So our job is to, through a classic back cross breeding program, not genetic engineering, but a classic way of approaching uh, breeding of trees in this case. It takes about 35 years to go through the generations we need. And the plan is to bring this tree back into the eastern forest, Maine to Georgia, west to the Mississippi River, 
and we have 16 state chapters that we've formed so people can get involved, help out on a local basis, and help us uh, with the orchards and the breeding program to help restore this magnificent tree. Very beneficial to wildlife and also to people, timber, nuts, lots of quality to the tree. And this is our program and we have a very successful early sign that we're going to be able to have competitive trees back in the forest and returning to the eastern part of our United States. So I'm pleased to be here and also with the film festival. Uh, it's a great time to be back on Long Island. with a gentleman that needs absolutely no introduction, but I will do it anyway. Mr. Bob Simon from CBS News 60 Minutes. And Bob will be speaking tonight regarding some of his work that he's done with different wildlife species, uh, I guess in Africa and in some other countries that Africa, are dear to your heart. Brazil, North Pole, all around, hot, cold, east, west. Any particular, of the, I, I saw your one program regarding lions and, and furidan in Africa. Uh, is there any one or that that are very dear to your heart? Frankly, I only started doing wildlife stories six or seven years ago. <laughs> and they all get very dear to your heart. Okay. They really do. In fact, I can't think of any of them that I didn't end up loving. Do you have anything that uh, sort of on your table, that, something that you haven't done yet regarding particular species yeah, or ecosystem? Yeah, white rhinos. Okay. Because they're in very deep trouble. And very uh, deep trouble. when do you hope to... Um, we hope yeah. to shoot that in November. Okay. Are you familiar that uh, yesterday was International Rhino Day? I didn't know that, no. And uh, I was very disappointed to see that the Sumatran rhino is now down to only 200 animals. And uh, it's uh, the smallest of the rhino species, and it's also sort of like a hairy, woolly rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, CBS will consider doing something like that. And well, we'll, we'll, we'll do white rhinos first, first. because they are uh, they're really in trouble because they're getting hunted now, and not just by poachers, but by organized gangs. Okay. And so they're getting killed at an astonishing rate because their um, their horns are worth more than gold in China. So. Uh, it's all about money. Yes, unfortunately it is, but Bob, I can't thank you enough for being here this evening and for being a part of this event. And we hope it grows over the years and we hope we can continue having you come out and maybe get CBS more involved in the future regarding your, your wildlife, your environmental programs. Next time we'll bring a lion. Hopefully. <laughs> we all grew up learning that the lion is the king of the jungle. And now that we're not brutal anymore, we know just how vulnerable they are. In fact, when exposed to man's devices, lions are extremely fragile. The latest weapon being used against them is poison. Yes, poison. African herders, whose livestock and livelihood are threatened by lions, are killing them in the most effective and economical way they can. And overwhelmingly, that's by using a cheap American chemical called Furidan. It's marketed as a pesticide to be used for protecting crops, but it's bought by many to kill animals. And that's one reason why conservationists say Africa's lions are in trouble. We took a journey through the bush in Kenya to find out what's going on. We learned that 20 years ago, there were some 200,000 lions in Africa. Today, there are 30,000, and the numbers are going down all the time. Lions are being poisoned at a staggering rate. There's little chance that these cubs will make it to adulthood. Are you suggesting that the lion in Kenya could become extinct? I'm suggesting that the lion in Africa will become extinct. I am with someone who, by the very definition of conservation, both she and her entire family has been some of the leading conservationists over the last 50 years. And 
Celine Cousteau, welcome to the event here in Sag Harbor. Thank you. And uh, we are absolutely honored and delighted to have you. We had your brother here last year. And can you tell us a little about the uh, the three films that we're going to be screening uh, both tonight and, and tomorrow? Sure. Um, well, all three films are related to the same idea, and that is to give a voice to nonprofit organizations, grassroots and individual people who are finding solutions to environmental and cultural issues. So what I've done basically is amplify their voice by giving them a visual communication tool. Um, they're all short documentaries that can be seen on the internet and through film festivals. And the idea really is to get the word out about the heroes that are out there working day in and day out to solve problems, sometimes created by humans and sometimes not. And, um, and hopefully give them a place to really talk about themselves. Excellent. Well, I can't thank you enough for being part of this year's event. And my thank you to your brother, who I'm, I know I won't see him tonight, but thank you for being out here. You. And hopefully we can have uh, the two of you out here next year and maybe have all the custodes, including your father, maybe <laughs> maybe for our, our for our 10th film festival. Coordinating uh, all of us is, is certainly a feat, so good luck. It's a challenge, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, with Celine Cousteau for the second annual Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival in Sag Harbor, New York. Again, it's our second year. We hope that we can continue doing this year after year at the Bay Street Theater. And thank you to Gary Higlin, the manager, and to Tracy Mitchell for the executive director for allowing us to be here. And we hope to continue doing this here at the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor for years to come. Uh, tonight, what we have is a, thank you. We have a, a series of about uh, a half a dozen short films. I believe all are world premieres. Uh, Amazon Promise by Celine Cousteau, After the Oil Spill by, by Marshall Case, The Impact on Wildlife. Amazon is very difficult to live in. Every day for the people that live in these isolated communities is a struggle just to get food. And they depend on the NGOs, such as Amazon Promise, to come in and give them medical attention. Health is such an important, huge issue. I mean, it's the most important, you know. Health is the most important. You can, education is up there, but if you're not healthy, you can't study, you can't educate yourself or be educated if you're not healthy. I was a jungle guide on the rivers and the villages, bringing adventure tourists through. And more and more, I started seeing how people were very sick, and then I wasn't able to help them very much. People would kind of sit around my mosquito and wait for me to wake up so they could ask me for medicines. And um, at one point, I had to give stitches. It was kind of like, you know, it's kind of getting scary. People were counting on me for their medical care. And I just realized that I was going to have to do something more than just bring tourists through to trade for their artisan and their crafts. So little by little, I was able to get people together involved that were interested. You know, we were able to help people very easily with very little at the beginning. That's how it started. So it became a formal uh, nonprofit in the States in 1993. Uh, Celine Cousteau, I did the first piece on Amazon Promise. Um, there's two more showing tomorrow. Um, I guess I can explain a little bit. Maybe that's a good way to start. Um, Amazon Promise was the, the first of what is going to be hopefully a, a, a lifetime of uh, short documentaries about the work of grassroots organizations and individuals working around the world, um, not just on environmental issues, but also on sociocultural challenges. Um, it's a way to really amplify their voice and, and give them a visual storytelling tool that they can communicate their stories with. And so they are... In a sense, it's a, I'm forming a nonprofit for nonprofits to fill a gap um, that a lot of nonprofits are finding. So um, I went out there and um, just filmed on my own. Actually, I went as a volunteer to help the medical team. And um, when I wasn't in wound care or washing lice or doling out medication, I was running out with my camera. And um, what you saw tonight was the result of that. Um, now, thankfully, I'm a two-person team in the field, which is a lot easier. <laughs> Um, and hopefully we'll keep making these films.
Marshall Case, uh, president of the Trust for Wildlife, which started back in 1983. Uh, the film this evening was after the Gulf and the uh, jeopardy of habitats and wildlife there. Uh, most of this was filmed within the last three to five months, so it's very current. The interviews were done about three months ago with the Louisiana Fish and Wildlife people. And nothing was staged. They knew what we were doing in terms of getting this out to the public, so they were very honest with their statements and uh, pretty telling, as you could see. The one that came right after that very short, the puffins and peregrines, this is the trailer to lead into the next one we're working on, which is the success of certain species as the peregrine recovery program, and also leading into ones that we think could be a, a success if we work on it, like the red knot, which a lot of you may know about. It's a world traveler, Chile to the Arctic. Uh, very dependent on the Delaware Bay and the horseshoe uh, crab eggs. And we'd like to see that elevated and more attention paid, otherwise we'll, we'll lose that species probably in our lifetime. <clears throat> the trust is based out of Vermont, and most of our work has been done in uh, Russia for quite a few years, about 70 films produced with World of Animals, and then some in uh, Ecuador, and now Colombia with Proavis, working on the Cerulean Warbler and uh, Shade Grown Coffee which is the second, well, coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. Most people don't know that. So last year we presented a film on neotropical migrant birds and in the North and Latin Americas to call attention to the coffee trade and try to get people aware of shade-grown coffee, which is only 3% on the market, but is organic, fair trade, and uh, does not decimate the rainforest, as does the open-grown coffee, which is 97%. So a simple shift in coffee habits um, could actually help the environment a lot for our neotropical migrants. <laughs> Photographer Steve Winter has been a jaguar groupie for years and was helping us look for the cats. He has shot what could be the finest jaguar portraits ever taken. They weren't easy to come by. I spent the first three months in the jungle and got a big fat zero. Really? No cats. Three months. Right. How'd you feel about that? I felt like my career was over. <laughs> <laughs> we were beginning to feel the same way. So we headed out again at night. Our spiders told us that they could see the reflection of their lights in the eyes of a jaguar a hundred yards away. We were skeptical. We were wrong. That's like 80 to 85 kilos. And that's a relatively small jaguar in this area. Look at her. God, she's beautiful. Oh, man, and then she looks right at you. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Yeah, this was great sighting. But the best was yet to come. A few minutes later, we happened to be there as a jaguar swam from one side of the river to the other. It was a once-in-a-lifetime shot in the dark. This is a rare sight. I've never caught them in the water. I've never gotten it in the water before. Now it's a young one. Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, zoologist, scholar, scientist, was as excited as a kid at the zoo. Perhaps more excited. That was spectacular. I've never seen that before. What luck. What unbelievable luck. Just as it's swimming across. There was no fear there. That was just pure curiosity. I'm like, what are you guys bothering me about? <laughs> I'm a reporter and I know nothing about wildlife. It just happened that over the last six or seven years I've done some animal stories, which you saw tonight, and looking at them myself I found it amazing that I get paid for this. What we could ascertain just doing this wide variety and without having any any academic um, background is the totally different challenges which the different animals face and some of them I think just are insolvable for example the polar bear his habitat is being destroyed and there's nothing anyone can do to save it uh, polar bears are now scavenging on dry land in the summertime, which they never had to do before. And they're having a very hard time getting through the summer when there's no ice anymore. And for example, you might remember just a few weeks ago, some very adventurous and well-meaning 
um, adventurers who were on a glacier near the North Pole in Norwegian territory were, were attacked and some of them were killed. And polar bears don't do that. Polar bears don't attack unprovoked. They shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been anywhere near where they were. Now on lions, we felt awfully good when I think at least partly in release to our program, Furidan, we shamed the corporation, which is a nice thing to do. And they took Furidan off the market. And that's nice. Um, exactly, you know. We all feel good about it, but that's not the problem. The problem is there are too many people. And the reason that farmers use Furidan, buy Furidan, is because lions are killing their, their livestock. And if Furidan gets totally off the market, as it pretty much is now, so farmers are going to get M16s. They're not going to let their, their livestock be killed because it's what they need for survival. So what's going to happen? I think the only ultimate hope for the lion are large game parks, which mean that there's not going to be any wildlife anymore. I mean, putting a lion in a game park is a lot better than putting him in a zoo, but he doesn't have his wandering nomadic life anymore. The irony is on sharks that while you know, polar bears and lions and can be quite lovable, um, sharks are difficult to love, but they're also in very serious trouble, and they're in serious trouble because of money, because their shark fins are worth so much. In the Orient, people will pay a fortune for shark fins. I think that they have all sorts of medicinal qualities. And they're now being hunted in a very, very organized way. And it's terribly, terribly horrible to watch because once the shark is taken aboard the fishing boat, the fins are cut off and then they're put back into the water. So it's a horrible thing to see. And how do you deal with this? I don't know. Um, can you prevent the Chinese from wanting shark fins? I don't think so. Um, can money do it? I doubt it because the, the money involved, the profits involved in killing sharks are enormous. Jaguars are, are actually pretty hopeful because we went down to Brazil and they're doing something about it there, and they can do it. There are plenty of, plenty of jaguars left in Brazil. The problem is that because, once again, of the great enemy, which is people, uh, their lanes, their corridors, have been cut off by highways and by farms and by suburbs. So the jaguars are in pockets now, and they can't travel. And if they stay in their pockets and inbreed, as our wonderful guide said, they're eventually going to become as dysfunctional as the royal family. <laughs> so they're trying to rebuild these corridors. And the way they're doing it is by making, with a lot of money, is the only answer. And there are some very wealthy people involved, and they're doing some very intelligent things, which is making life really better for the people, for the farmers who live in these corridors. And it's sort of like building them schools and health care and, and the rest of it to convince them that it's worthwhile not to um, kill jaguars anymore. Christopher Gervais, the, the founder of the Wildlife Conservation Film Festivals, my background is environmental science and marine biology. And actually before that, I did a stint as a, as a vertebrate paleontologist studying fossils in, in South Dakota and realized that... Uh, I wanted to actually study species that were still alive and, and help keep them that way. Uh, thank you to everyone that's here tonight. My filmmakers, our, our attendees, our supporters. Uh, this is something we hope to do year after year. And uh, a lot of the films that we show, they're not all doom and gloom. Many of the species uh, can be saved, have been saved, brought back from the extinction. But uh, people ask me, are these Bambi films? And the answer is no. Uh, they're not intended to be. They are intended to get the message across. Uh, clear and concise by letting people know not just here in Sag Harbor but worldwide that these species and habitats 
must be protected. Not simply because they look nice or it makes us feel good about ourselves, but because the removal of one species from an ecosystem can, can wreak havoc upon that. And the loss of these pristine ecosystems will have a direct impact on us, on our food availability, our clean water, our clean air. And not just for us here, but for our children and our children's children a hundred, a thousand years from now. And uh, we hope that these film festivals that are planned now, and perhaps some that we may bring globally, will be able to change the minds of, of people, say, living in, in China or Asia, that feel that they must have a bowl of shark fin soup uh, because it's absolutely essential to their, to their diet when, in fact, it has no nutritional value whatsoever. Uh, that's the message we, we hope to get across uh, through the use of films. Uh, I use a quote from Celine from your grandfather, people protect what they love, and what better way to get someone here or in Singapore or uh, in Los Angeles by seeing a whale shark or a wombat. Not everyone will get a chance to see that in the wild. And if they don't see that particular animal, they're not going to have an interest in it. They're not going to have a love for it. And hence, they'll have absolutely no reason to want to protect it. And getting them at an early age, or even as adults, uh, through the use of film, I think, I know that we can change uh, the hearts and minds of many people who are not quite yet sold that preserving wildlife is for the benefit of humanity. I'm with an extraordinary filmmaker, Kevin Bakar, who is the producer and director of Killer Whales, Wolves of the Sea, an extraordinary film. And thank Kevin, you. thank you for your participation this year, and tell us how you got involved with the film festival and a little bit about uh, the film. Uh, well, we heard about the Hamptons Wildlife Conservation Film Festival, uh, the second annual, okay. and we wanted to be involved. There's not too many wildlife film festivals on the East Coast no. or in the New York area, so it was something we definitely wanted to be involved in. Uh, the Killer Whales film is a film that we worked on for Discovery Channel and we traveled all over the world from Argentina to New Zealand to South Africa all the way to the Pacific Northwest and Antarctica following the predatory habits of killer whales. Okay. It's an extraordinary film. I know the audience absolutely loved it. It was screened today. I know it's up for an award here at the film festival. You have told me a little about your future film projects. We're looking forward to seeing them and we hope you can participate for many years to come with this film festival here in the Eastern Seaboard. Oh, we'd love it and keep oh. doing what you're doing because it's great having it here in the Hamptons and having something on the East Coast like this. Hi, I'm Kathleen Frith and I'm here at Sag Harbor. I'm going to screen my film called Once Upon a Tide. And Once Upon a Tide is a family film that talks about how our health depends on a healthy ocean. And it's a pleasure to be here at this film festival. I think it's really a wonderful way to talk to people in the community here about um, some really important conservation issues and through the artist's portrayal of these animals and these habitats, um, people can really resonate with what is at stake um, and be inspired to conserve the natural world upon which we all depend. This is a story you might find hard to believe, but I assure you that it is true. It is a tale of a magical spell, a grand adventure, and you. It begins not far from here, on an ordinary day, in an extraordinary time. Certainly you must know that looks can be deceiving, and that is the case with this picture. You see, unknown to the people of this town, and the people all around the world, a strange spell has been cast. This spell caused everyone to forget about one of the most important things on Earth. Everyone has forgotten about the ocean. Well, almost everybody. 
There was one little girl who recently heard the call of the ocean from a shell. And although she'd never seen the ocean, she was curious and determined to find it. Venturing into the unknown was a little scary. What would she see? My name is Paul Stoutenberg, and last summer I had a chance to make a documentary about vanishing wildlife of Eastern Long Island. And so this summer I got to work for the Nature Conservancy, and I made two documentaries for them, one about sea level rise in wetlands, and one about le LEAF, or Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future. So my documentary last summer was about five different locally endangered wildlife species of the Hamptons, or of Eastern Long Island, and with interviews on local biologists. Um, so anyway, this summer I took it a little further. I finally found the hognose snake, so I put that footage in there, and I definitely hope to keep covering uh, endangered species on the east eastern end of Long Island. Over two hours of searching, we did almost four hours of searching with Jeremy the other day. No luck. Hognose snakes were actually considered by a lot of local biologists when I, when I started first working on them to be extirpated or locally extinct throughout the entirety of Long Island. We were pleasantly surprised to find that that wasn't the case. And I've never seen a hognose population that occurred where toads didn't occur. So we finally found a hognose snake in the dunes and he's being pretty tame. He's not trying to bite me or anything. Usually they're very aggressive, but they'll never actually bite you. Hognose snakes aren't venomous at all. They're completely benign. They don't even bite, although they will pretend to. These snakes use an entire routine of bluff uh, techniques to scare predators and people, but they they are harmless. And if you lose those critical open spaces, whether it's grassland, scrubland, or sandy dunes or sand complexes, you will lose the hognose. Where you see them on Long Island now are the few places, the few wild places that are really truly protected. We hope that those of you that attended this year had a, a wonderful time. We will be doing this again in September of 2012 for the third annual event. We hope that if you're able to support us in any way, you can do so by volunteering or coming to our website, which is www.wildlifefilmfestivals.com. We hope to see you again next